Today I'm going to talk to you about a game that I'm developing called Power Outage, and I am super low on that. Drink that. Alright, cancel that. And there we go. Sorry. So, Power Outage. What's Power Outage? Power Outage is a tabletop RPG designed to be GM'd by adults and played with by kids. Uh, the kids take on the role of superheroes on an island in the uh, Bering Strait called Outage. Uh, it has become a part of actually Alaska, so it's called Outage Alaska, although it is in and of itself the size of a continent. Um, so what differentiate what is let's take it from the beginning for anybody that is new to the genre what is a tabletop rpg a tabletop rpg is a uh, method uh it's a game style that is somewhat a uh, guided storytelling where a person takes on the role of gm or a uh, game master and they take on the role of guiding players through a story. And they take on the role of this the narrator, as well as all of the characters or roles that um, the players themselves are not taking on themselves. So all the villains, all the uh, you know, accomplices, all the people that they interact with, they take on this actual, like, almost acting role um, of those characters uh, within the game. And then the players themselves take on a role themselves. They build a character, and they um, take on the, the role of that character, um, So th and, uh, and they uh, work towards, through the story, um, trying to accomplish specific tasks and things like that. So Power Outage is a uh, tabletop RPG um, role-playing game uh, designed more for children. Uh, so what differentiates Power Outage from some of the other RPGs that are out there? For starters, uh, it's designed for kids. Um, and with that, um, it means that the children, uh, that take on these roles, uh, don't uh, necessarily run the risk of, uh, dying in the game. That's something that is very common in a lot of RPGs. Now, of course, uh, the rule book is written, uh, a lot of, like, a guide, so that can choose what you want to add and what you don't want to add depending on the group scenario that you're in but I guess I can get to that later um, so I uh, see here where to begin well, let's talk about how what what components of power outage there are uh, power outage has the system called the cape system uh, combat alternative puzzle and exploration uh, let me just show you that right over here. And the way that that works is it basically becomes a choose your own adventure within the story so that, let's see here, am I recording? I believe I'm recording. I am recording. Uh, and I have good signal, great. So the way that it works is uh, the CAPE system uh, takes uh, events within a storyline and compartmentalizes them into types. Uh, and then the pre-published adventures will have these things called cape paths, which are paths that a person that is running a game would be able to select to kind of customize the game that is meant for their group. So in combat, you'll see the kids uh, uh, engaging in uh, like a actual physical combat with the enemies. 
that we create. Um, in alternative, there is, for every combat, there is an alternative. Alternative components allow you to go through an engagement without necessarily using any form of um, violent encounter within the game. Typically, that means using the uh, environment or solving a puzzle in order to accomplish somewhat similar results to that of the uh, combat component. Uh, the next component is puzzle. And that is a basically a component that you could add if you want to specifically add a puzzle that the kids will be working on within the game. Most often than more often than not, puzzle components are either required for alternative uh, the alternative component, or they're just elective. If you want to take them, you can take them. If you don't, you don't have to. And then finally, exploration. Exploration is the point within the game where kids will be doing a majority of the role playing. Um, that means that the kids will be acting out as their heroes set within a world that the GM builds for them. So I'll give you an example from our existing plague session. Uh, kids, uh, you know, as the GM, I start off the story explaining how, you know, the heroes have been called to the commissioner's office to describe, uh, as he describes a problem to them. At that point, I might open it up to the players to ask the commissioner, who I am now playing, you know, what questions they might have. They might answer a question, they might ask those questions, and based off of the information I have for that session, provide them with that information. So explore, exploration involves the guided storytelling component of the game, for the most part, that exists outside of solving puzzles or actually getting into combat. It also means that they're actually exploring their environment. They're asking questions about what's in the environment around them, um, do they notice anything? Can they find anything? Are there any clues? Etc. Uh, Etc. Et so, what's great about the Cape Path system is that it uh, kind of encapsulates each of these components into smaller, um, more manageable segments. That allows you to keep session times um, shorter while stacking multiple sessions um, back to back. So you can basically run an entire session in 10 to 15, you know, 15 to 20 minutes without being this, without it being this full four hour ordeal, um, which is often the case with a lot of RPG games. I mean, typically they run anywhere about four, one hour to four hours. Um, these are meant to be um, small bite-sized pieces that allow a person, uh, like, you know, a busy parent such as myself to be able to sit down with their kids, play a quick game or play a small section of the game um, before putting things away and moving on. So that's the Cape Path system. Um, separate from that, um, all the characters, all the kids create their own superheroes. Now this is unique in that a lot of uh, tabletop RPGs compartmentalize the creation of a character. Um, you know, they, they select certain races like, uh, you know, like, uh, like half elves or dwarves or humans or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they break them off into specific classes like the fighter or the mage or the, you know, the, um, the rogue, et cetera. Uh, t uh, power outage is a little bit different. So what Power Outage does is it allows the kids to create whatever character they want. Um, and that character can be anything that they want to, to be, anything they want to do. But it does it in a way that creates, that puts that expansive framework into an environment that is still playable so that the kids are still playing at a, a specific level that you can kind of manage and control. And the way that's done is through this power system. And I'll just scroll through here to, uh, to that. Uh, 
here we go. So the way that the powers work are when you're creating a character, uh, typically you'll ask your kid to start thinking about what kind of character they want to create. I'll give you an example. My, my uh, two daughters, who I started playing this game with, uh, came up with Ice Princess and uh, Butterfly Girl. Um, so what I asked them to do was try to come up with three different, four different powers that uh, their superhero has. And as they came up with the power, like, you know, Butterfly Girl can fly, um, Ice Princess has an icy sword that does damage, what you can do is um, I've created this power system uh, uh, where I've broken up the powers into three different kinds of powers. So there are combat powers, which allow you to basically do a uh, type of damage, you can call it, to an enemy. Uh, support powers, which allow you to help a friend or help yourself or boost their stats and things like that. Or utility powers, which allow you to do kind of unique, cool things that um, help with like mobility or help with the um, overall just your 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 um, tool belt of th cool things that any superhero can do. So you got combat, you got utility, and you have support. Now the way that the tables are laid out, it seems very bland and generic. I labeled all of the powers, you know, combat A, combat B, combat C, combat D. But the reason I did this is because what you do is you don't start with the power itself, you start with the effect of the power. So if I have an icy sword that just does a good deal of damage to a person right next to me, then my, I might choose combat B, um, which does uh, 2d4 damage, and I'll explain that later, to an enemy that's next to him. What that means then is I apply my own, um, what's typically called flavor text, to the power. Um, so that whether or not I am using an icy sword or a flaming sword or an electric stun baton or a zapping gun or a uh, or even like a poison mist or whatever the case may be, um, if that is the effect of the power, then I can apply whatever the rationale for how that effect gets placed as the power of my character. So in that way, a kid can create any kind of power that they want and typically find a, an, an effect that could approximately match that power. Now, without getting into it in this video, there are a ton of options for uh, either creating new powers, combining powers, or if you want to, just creating your own powers, and there's kind of guidance on how to do that without, um, without, uh, without you know, breaking the system, as it were. Um, and then, of course, through the website, poweroutagegame.com, you can actually submit powers, and those, those powers would become canon, you know, to the storyline. These are powers that they can use. Um, and the other thing when creating a, a character is that every kid has a weakness. Now, this weakness can be a role-playing aspect. It could be something that impacts the character that they're creating. Um, it has a whole host of different options that gives you kind of flexibility about what you want to do. I can get into the scenarios of how that can work later. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the attributes of an individual, uh, any specific uh, kid. Let me jump to that section now. There you go. So there are four main attributes to any character. So let's say a kid, let's say you have two kids and they're creating their own superheroes. I'm going to assist them creating their character because I am the GM. 
what here are the um, attributes that the characters would have um, impact power omer and yield points so let's go through those impact is the ability to use a very humanistic sort of power it's punching it's kicking it's any kind of hit type uh, of attack it also describes um, any kind of physical activity that any person could potentially do given enough training or given enough exercise or given enough uh, of an opportunity so anything that requires a strength check anything that requires acrobatics or uh, or or um, endurance or things like that that all falls under impact but impact also has an effect on the actual presence like their um, their their impact on people uh, within discussion so this impact affects their presence it affects uh, their ability to uh, get people to see their way of thinking, whether it be through coercion or intimidation or just, you know, getting them to see uh, reason. Um, so that's impact. Uh, powers are your ability to effectively use the powers that I described earlier. Uh, power also describes any kind of superhuman capability. Your ability to see, and it primarily relates to your perception of things. It's, it's your perception of things and your heroic knowledge. So perception, what I mean by perception is your ability to see in the dark, your ability to narrow in and focus on a specific point within a room that your layman person might not have recognized or realized. It also describes um, your heroic knowledge. And this is an opportunity, this is a power that is, or this is an attribute that is used for the GM to say like, you know, if, if, if you're discovering that, if you see that your kids are having a tough time solving a mystery, you may want to assist them by suggesting that they are tapping into their heroic knowledge to realize a specific thing. And then you allow them to perform this power check, as it were. The, last, the, the third attribute is Omer. Now, this is kind of a pun on armor, which you typically hear in games. Omer is basically an ohm, the ability to resist a power, or really the ability to resist just about anything. Omer is a catch-all defense, um, and it occurs primarily in any kind of combat situation. So if I am getting attacked, I am using my Omer to defend. I'm by either from an impact attack or a power attack. Likewise, when I am attacking a villain, I am attacking their Omer. So that's Omer. And I can get into a little bit more about that when I describe how actual combat takes place. The last uh, attribute is yield points. So again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, in power outage, there is no real death. Um, instead, characters yield after a given amount of time. So this is a bit of a change from what you might have been familiar with of hearing health points. It's really just, it's very similar. It's just that at a certain point, the whatever they're fighting, whatever a person is fighting, either has to give up or they are rendered incapable of fighting for whatever reason. And um, the same occurs for uh, heroes. If they um, reach uh, zero yield points, then they are basically out of the fight. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're dead. It means they have the opportunity to regroup and come back together as a team. Um, and also within a combat, there are a ton of options for players to try to encourage their, uh, their teammates to um, 
to uh, to come back up. In fact, I should probably change the name of that um, to encourage rather than heal. Yeah, maybe it's a good idea. Um, so, how do you? So you have all these four attributes. How do you apply them to your character? So basically, every character starts off with two impact points, two power points, two uh, omer points, and then for their yield points, they have a base of 10, and then they roll a d6 dice. Now I'll show you the d6 dice looks like what you're typically familiar with, this square dice that you see right around here. Um, so you roll a d6 dice, and then let's say I rolled a 4 on a d6 dice, then my yield, my total yield points will be 14. So the best way to, to give you an idea of how this would play out within a combat um, is to say that when I am attacking something, uh, I am typically using either my impact or my power, and I'm using dice to roll against a villain's roll and their omer. So it is a dueling dice scenario. So for instance, um, when I roll an impact attack, I'm typically doing either a punch or a kick. At the very least at the first levels, I'm doing a punch or a kick. Now, a punch or a kick would mean that I would be hitting the, the character, and if I were to successfully achieve hitting the character, then I would roll, I would I'd have the option of either doing two points of damage to their yield points, which would subtract from their total yield points, or I could roll a d4 dice, which looks like this little pyramid right here, and um, I would be able to subtract that from their yield points. Now, as soon as their yield points drop down to zero yield points, that's it, they yield. They give up for that battle scenario. Um, so that's how kind of like impact would work. Now power works very much a similar way. If I'm attacking with my power, I am rolling uh, a dice, I'm adding my power score, but when my power affects, you know, successfully attacks uh, the villain, I get to choose the power that I have already selected and follow along with whatever the, um, whatever that power states I do. So the way that it works in combat is I roll, let's say I'm doing an impact attack. I'm going to roll a d20, which looks like this. It's a 20 sided dice. I'm going to roll a d20 and I'm going to add my impact score to that d20 dice. So if I roll a d20 and I get a 12 and I have two impact, I would add that two impact to my 12 and I would have a total impact, I'd have a total impact attack of 14. Now I would compare that to what the villain rolled. Now the villain will do a similar roll. They will roll a d20, but they will add their omer to their, um, to their roll. So let's say the villain rolls an eight and their omer is two. So my total roll would be 14. The villain's total roll would be 10. Because 14 is greater than 10, my impact roll successfully lands on that enemy. So that means I get a chance to either do two damage to their yield points, or again, 1d4 damage. Um, so the way that combat works is that combat occurs in turns, but it doesn't take the typical turns that you would see in um, turn-based combat that you might see in other RPGs where people, each person rolls an initiative, they find out what order they go in, etc., etc. The way that turn-based combat works in Power Outage is that each team takes their full turn um, before the next team takes the turn. So it's either the, the heroes or the villains. They all take their turn together. They're all technically taking their turn at the same time. 
So if I have a group, let's say for, let me paint a scenario. Let's say a group of my two heroes enter a building and then two villains appear. Now, the way that I determine who starts the combat or who starts the initiative is just through storytelling. So if I were to say these villains enter in the store and the heroes immediately elect to attack the villains, then the heroes go first and then the villains go second. Likewise, if the villains charged into the store attacking anything that they can find, then the villains might go first and the heroes might fo have to follow. So the unique aspect of power outage and doing turn order in this way means that it creates more flexibility for the heroes to strategize within their turn about what they want to do. So each player if of the two players may decide they will each separately attack or they might form a joint attack or they might you know, choose one person to attack because the other person is going to do something else. It gives you a lot more flexibility about what you do, a lot more strategizing, and it allows kids to start working more as teams whenever their turn comes up. It also reduces the back and forth turn order process because what you, what I've seen in uh, other games is you typically have like a couple people waiting and waiting and waiting for their turn to occur um, before they actually start getting engaged in the story. In this way, I've basically limited it to just two turns or, you know, changing turns. And because I have a greater control of what the villains do, I could reduce the amount of time that the villains' turns go for and increase the amount of time to where kids get the opportunity to create, collaborate and think and engage with each other. So, um, a player would decide, one player may decide to do an impact attack, the other player may decide to do a uh, powered attack. The, the impact attack would roll um, a d20, add their impact modifier, and roll that against me um, as they're attacking one of my villainous creatures. And I, as the playing the role of the villainous creature, would roll a d20 and add my Omer score to it. Now, typically, you'll find that the villains are rated slightly lower than the heroes that they're fighting against with regard to Omer and power. And that is because, partially because kids are going, well, as they're going through the combats, they're, they're kind of running again against several creatures that keep on coming at them. Um, and because they're, you know, heroic in their nature, they're fighting these kind of, um, henchmen for the most part. Um, so yeah, uh, now let's say the player was deciding to roll a power attack. They would roll a d20, they would add their power score, and then they, w I, as the villain, would roll a d20 and, um, add my Omer score. If they meet or get higher than my combined roll, they get to land the power attack on me. Now, soon, these, these combats occur in battles. Uh, a, a hero is allowed to use up to six powers before they are required to stop um, before they, they run out and basically are limited to impact attack. Or they can choose a different action that allows them to um, get some of those power uses back. Now let me jump to that real quick and describe what you can do on your turn, what each player can do within their turn. There's basically three actions that they can do. 
one action is, well, actually two actions, and then everything that is not those two actions is considered a free action. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain. So there are two things that you can do. You can do a standard action, you could do a travel action, or you could do a free action. A standard action is any type of action that is an attack or a hit or something along those lines. But it also is anything that a player can do that is like a physical interaction with something. Something that takes a little bit of time to actually physically do. Um, whether that be, you know, like start trying to hack a computer or working levers to try to get them, you know, a door to open or, um, you know, tampering with a security system or, um, you know, uh, or uh, defusing a, uh, a um, you know, a trap. Those are all standard actions. Travel actions are simply your player's movement within a, um, you know, space. Uh, that could be um, done in the theater of the mind, which means that you are describing the distance that you're moving, how far or near you are to a villain. Um, or it could actually be drawn out on a battle map, which is some the way that I typically play uh, for the most part. So I have a map that I've drawn out a room and I have my players uh, using tokens to describe their locations on the map in comparison to where the villains are. Um, so uh, travel describes that movement to and from the villains for the most part, or, or a r within a virtual space. And then free actions are basically any actions that are either like it could be a power that is specifically stated to be a free action because it doesn't take a lot of time to you know enable typically those are utility powers um or it is uh like just flying like flying is a utility power as a free action um, you know you, you start flying that's not really taking uh much of your turn it's until you start moving where flying actually becomes a travel action. Uh, the other, th so yeah, free action is just about anything that you do that is either uh, for a role playing standpoint or communication or something that is a small action that wouldn't typically take an entire turn to play. So the teams go back and forth, attacking or whatever the case may be to bring the other team's entire membership down to zero, at which point they've successfully achieved the battle and can move on. Um, so in that situ situation, first the heroes, the two heroes would attack the two villains, and, and then once they've gotten an opportunity to attack the two villains, the villains would get an opportunity to attack the heroes or do something else. This would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until one group is completely at zero, at which point the either the heroes get to proceed forward or the villains get to have defeated the heroes. Of course, part of the, the allure of the game is to encourage the players to continue continually, you know, engage and grow and things like that. Uh something about power outage is that um you gain additional experience by working together as a team. So that's kind of a positive thing that we've built in. I did want to draw one more uh, mention to the use of impact within combat. So even if your kids find themselves in combat with creatures, they don't necessarily have to engage in physical attacks against the creature. They can use their impact as the presence form of impact to create a situation where they um, de-escalate the 
engage me. That means that they select the target and they basically have to give an argument, a verbal argument to the GM about what they say or what they do to try to convince whatever the creature is to stop. Stop what they're doing, to, to, to yield, whatever, what have you. Um, then they roll their impact attack much in the same way that they're actually attacking the creature, but just that they are trying to get a valid point across to them. All they need is three successes for th along that line in order to, I guess, technically defeat a villain. But really, it's just defusing the situation so that the villain themselves yield because they no longer wish to attack. Um, so, a little bit about character creation, jumping back to character creation, and maybe I'm going to have to sort this out after all is said and done because I'm probably blathering on, is um, when you start creating a character, you start a character at level 1. At level 1, you get an impact score of 2, a power score of 2, an Omer score of 2, and yield points, which equals 10 plus 1d6 roll. So again, you roll the d6, you see what the number is, you add it to 10, and that's your yield points. Now, um, as you level up, you gain, now at level 1, you gain 3 attribute points. That means I can apply those 3 points to any of the 3 top attributes in any way, shape, or form I see fit. So I could say this character is going to have two impact because and you know and one ohm, one omer because one extra omer, bringing their total attributes to four impact, two power, and three omer. And I'm doing this because this is going to be a close in fighter. I'm not going to be relying on my powers all that much, so I'm just going to be punching what have you. So this kind of shifts. Um, this kind of allows the character, the, the, the kid, to truly create a unique character for themselves. Um, from that point forward, on even numbered levels, kids will roll a d3 plus 1 in order to gain additional yield points, or at odd levels, they'll get one additional attribute point that they could apply to each any one of their skills. Uh, now, first off, let me jump back and say, what is a D3? A D3 is basically a D6 roll. So that's the six-sided die that you're familiar with. Only a one to two counts as one, a three to four counts as two, and a five to six counts as three. So if I am going to be adding points to my yield points at level 2, I would roll a d6 as a d3. And let's say I rolled a 4. Well, 4 counts as a 2 because, again, 1 to 2 is 1, 3 to 4 is 2, 5 to 6 is 3. So that's 2 plus the whatever the score is at that level. So at level 2, it would be d3 plus 1. So 2 plus 1, that means I get an extra 3 points of yield, yield points. Um, the, uh, the one other rule about applying attribute points is that uh, as you do it, the, um, after you apply attribute points at level 3, you are no longer allowed, well, you can't apply attribute points to the last attribute that you applied points to. So what does that mean? That means if I dumped all of the points I possibly could by level 3 into impact, so that I have 6 impact, 2 power, 2 omer, by level 5, when I get an attribute again, I can't dump that sixth power into impact, I have to put it into either power or omer. Um, and that's kind of been done so that we can prevent um, one person 
blowing up all of their attribute points into one target, you know, into one attribute without using anything else. It may it makes things uh, easier to manage within the, the game system. Now, experience points are earned, and the experience points allow you to level your character up. You gain experience points by solving a component. And typically, there are different things that occur within any component, combat, again, combat, alternative, uh, puzzle, and explora exploration, that gives you a certain amount of points. Let's say fighting an enemy gives you five points. That goes into your bank of points. You need a certain amount of points in order to reach a new level. Um, as you reach new levels, you get new powers or you get the, the ability to do things. Um, man, I really need to focus on not jumping around too much in this. But let's talk about other standard actions. There are other standard actions that you can do within combat. One of those actions is to regenerate, although I might now change that to encourage because I think that sounds cooler. Uh, but basically, regenerate means that you have the ability, or anybody has the ability as a player, to um, help boost up a, another player's or your, your own uh, yield points. And you can do that by... Um, Whatever you want to regenerate, you have to roll a d20, and it has to beat a 10. If it beats a 10, then you get to roll a d6, which is the standard square-sized die. And whatever you land on that 6, that's how many yield points you get back. Um, so even if a character reaches 0 yield points, a pl another player may be able to bring them back by regenerating them. Um, Sorry. Um, the other option is within relation to powers. So as I said earlier, you have six powers that you can use before you no longer have the ability to use a power. It's basically like your kids are batteries then you've basically used up the remainder of your battery at which point you can choose to either energize or super energize energize it means that you um, you uh, roll uh, you basically take a defensive stance which means you're not allowed to attack um, for up to two rounds uh, during that defensive stance you um, take half the damage you would normally take if you are attacked. But then at the end of um, Energize, you're able to roll a d4 to get that many uh, powers back. Although, come to think of it, maybe I'll change that to a d6. Oh no, that, that occurs at a later uh, level, so that's fine. Um, you also have the option of super energizing. Um, super energizing takes three three rounds, uh, and it also um, means that not only are you not able to attack, but you're also not able to move. So you become this like stationary thing that can't move or attack. That might require the other players, your friends, to come to your aid and defend you as you energize. So I figured that that might be a good dynamic and team building attribute. Um, now I just want to jump down to a couple of the villains so you can see how the villains look. Sorry, big book. But easy to play once you get the hang of it. And you can watch our um, power outage uh, episodes here on Twitch. Um, to uh, or if you're watching this on YouTube, on my Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash bbars, spelled B as in Bravo, E as in Echo, B as in Bravo, A R, C as in Charlie, E as in Echo. Although you'll probably see my name just about everywhere else on whatever page you're watching this on. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea of how some of these um, uh, 
villains look like. Uh, let's take Robo Troopers for instance. Robo Troopers have two impact, zero power, zero omer, and eight yield points. They have the ability to travel for up to seven spaces. And they themselves have no powers. All they can do is either 1d4 or 2 damage. Now, what I want you to note is that these also have weaknesses. What the weaknesses state is that the weaknesses are actually meta characteristics that your uh, players could do outside of the game that actually impacts the game itself or the characters within the game itself. So, for example, uh, for Robo Troopers, it says practice an art since the last session and you gain 5 YP at the start of the battle. Another one says if the allowance was saved since the last session, you add a plus 2 to your attack rolls, uh, either for impact or power. So this is a great way of encouraging kids to, or, you know, taking the game of power outage and using it as a uh, educational toolkit or an educational uh, asset. Um, so let's see here. We've covered combat for the most part. Oh, I did want to say one more last thing. Let me think of all the small aspects that you uh, that might not be picked up. Uh, let's see here. Um, so a couple things. Um, if you are knocked over, then Getting up counts as your full travel action. Um, however, your travel transactions is only limited to the number of spaces. You're not actually limited to when you can use travel. So you don't have to like travel then attack or attack and then travel. You could travel, attack, and then travel once again. Um, it's supposed to be fluid. Uh, so there's that. Um, what other aspects should I mention in combat? Uh, I think that's about it. I mean, you roll against, uh, you know, you're, you're rolling against characters, you're playing against them, and, and uh, they reach a point where they're either yield or um, they have an opportunity to attack back. Uh, so, um, I've covered just about a large part of the mechanics. Um, oh, uh, one more aspect to that. Uh, you'll have to read through the book if you want to get more detail and get like you know all the nuances that I'm probably missing in this video. Um, so. Let's talk, let's uh, shift gears here and talk about the lore a little bit. What is power outage? Power outage is, uh, was originally um, an island or continent really that appeared in the North Central Pacific. It appeared at one point um, basically out of the mists. Uh, nobody exactly knows you know, where it came from, how it came to be, but it just, one at one point in the 18th century, showed up. Now, the first people to discover this island were Japanese sailors. And the, where they landed, they landed in the, um, what they discovered was the ancient ruins of a structure that built deeper and deeper into the ground. Um... Shortly thereafter, their, shortly after their discovery, the the island was also discovered by um, the uh, what approximated for the uh, Russian uh, uh, government at the time. Um, so Russia actually became invested in outage, well, what is now outage. Uh, for a lot of unique mineral deposits that they had never discovered, and they were like looking into the, the aspects of that. Um, there eventually became some violent clashes between the two superpowers as each one jockeyed for more and more land and position and control over the island proper. And it wasn't until 
Uh, in fact, it did lead to a war between the two uh, powers at one point. And it wasn't until uh, the majority of the island was actually, you could argue, illegally sold to uh, the American uh, the Americans that things started changing drastically. Uh, the Americans got involved in the Russo-Japanese War. Um, they took over a large, you know, pretty much a majority of the island. But they discovered that it would work better for them to leave the isolated colonies um, that each country has established. So Russia has established its location in a city known as the Atomnya Zavad. The Japanese have um, located in a place called uh, Atom, uh, um, Shorai City. Um, the American crew has built a experimental uh, military base called Seward's uh, Refuge. Um, and over a lot of hostilities and a lot of uh, negotiations and eventually a lot of uh, collaboration, they, the, the countries finally reached a point where they are somewhat symbiotic uh, in their relationship in controlling the island. Uh, they, they each see benefit in working with other sections of the island. The, the actual conflict has died down severely. Sorry about that, get thirsty. Um, there are five sections of um, the outage. Uh, Shorai City is the uh, Japanese colony. So the Japanese, uh, because of restrictions imposed on them after the, uh, after the American, uh, uh, the American party slowly took over majority of the island, um, somewhat erroneously, uh, the uh, Japanese colony decided to build upward. Meanwhile, the, uh, the, the, they built upward on top of the ruins of this previous ancient civilization that they discovered that actually built downward. So their build upward seems to mirror the downward um, uh, uh, ruins that they've discovered. Uh, Shorai City is this huge futuristic metropolis. Think actually metropolis from the Superman storyline and that gives you a clear, somewhat a clear, uh, I guess my um, Primary uh, thoughts were along the lines of, you know, the Fifth Element, um, Akira, uh, Blade Runner, um, um, you know, and even Metropolis, really. Uh, the ideas of, like, this futuristic, uh, yet continuously plagued by superheroic activities uh, city. The Atanya Zavad is a little bit different. The Atanya Zavad is actually owned and operated by a company out of uh, Russia. So all of its citizens are technically employees of that corporation. Um, they are, uh, the city itself is somewhat older and more Victorian. They still use vehicles and things like that. In fact, a majority of everything is powered through uh, nuclear batteries. So it's kind of got a atomic punk vibe to it. And the other intriguing aspect of uh, Tanya Zavad is at some point, um, the city went dark. And there is no actual explanation, even though the, the three powers um, at large have created a space program, there is no understood rationale as to why sunlight doesn't seem to shine down on the Atomia Zavad. If, you know, from seen from a satellite view, it's just darkness at all times, darkness. Uh, but because of that, 
the Atomni Zavad has a very noir feel to it. Um, and a lot of these uh, locations are kind of built with a gameplay style in mind so that kids can really explore the different types of table RP, tabletop RPGs that are out there. Uh, then there's the sink. The sink is interesting because the sink is a peninsula on the south eastern coast of Outage. And it is actually constantly sinking into the ocean while the par another part of it is being rebirthed into the continent. What's fascinating about that, however, is that they're discovering the ancient ruins actually exist within the newly replaced infra you know, um, land that is occurring. So there is still investigation about how that stuff actually happened. Uh, Seward's Refuge is the uh, American scientific military base. It um, has the one of the world's only operating um, space elevators, so very important um, location. And it also um, serves as a barrier to an experiment that they've uh, unfortunately caused themselves called the overgrowth. Um, now what the overgrowth is, is a sentient forest jungle habitat that sprang up in the, I believe, the 1960s or 70s um, in an attempt to uh, create um, uh, uh, super grow, you know, super crops within the uh, country. Uh, it, the, it, it backfired and the sentient forest has been, has kind of come awake and has actually been attacking the walls to try to spread their um, growth across, you know, at the very least outage, but across the world maybe too. Uh, so those are the five regions. Um, I think I'm going to wrap that up for today. Uh, I'll get into a purely lore uh, video session later, but I know I've gone over a lot today and probably enough to... Um, make it difficult for you to, you know, fully encompass. Um, so to recap a little bit, um, feel free to check out the webpage, poweroutagegame.com. Look for Power Outage Kickstarter coming soon. Um, you can support me on Patreon, and I'm at patreon.com slash poweroutage. Um, you know, like or subscribe, or follow or subscribe, to Twitch, which also eventually helps along the way. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, listening to me uh, blather on for over an hour about Power Outage. Take care. Bye.